Good evening and welcome back to Booked for the Night. I'm Melissa Phillips and tonight I'm reading chapters 9 through 11 of East of Eden by John Steinbeck. Enjoy. Chapter 9 Mr. Edwards carried on his business of whoremaster in an orderly and unemotional way. He maintained his wife and his two well-mannered children in a good house in a good neighborhood in Boston. The children, two boys, were entered on the books at Groton when, the, when they were infants. Mrs. Edwards kept a dustless house and controlled her servants. There were, of course, many times when Mr. Edwards had to be away from home on business, but he managed to live an amazingly domestic life and to spend more evenings at home than you could imagine. He ran his business with a public accountant's neatness and accuracy. He was a large and powerful man, running a little too fat in his late forties, and yet in surprisingly good condition for a time when a man wanted to be fat if only to prove prove he was a success. He had invented his business, the circuit route through the small towns, the short stay of each girl, the discipline, the percentages. He felt his way along and made few mistakes. He never sent his girls into the cities. He could handle the hungry constables of the villages, but he had respect for the experienced and voracious big city police. His ideal stand was a small town with a mortgaged hotel and no amusements one where his only competition came from wives and, a, and an occasional wayward girl. At this time, he had 10 units. Before he died at 67 of strangulation on a chicken bone, he had groups of four girls in each of 33 small towns in New England. He was better than well fixed. He was rich, and the manner of his death was in itself symbolic of success and well-being. At the present time, the institution of the whorehouse seemed to a certain extent to be dying out. Scholars have various reasons to give. Some say that the decay of morality among girls has dealt the whorehouses its death blow. Others, perhaps more idealistic, maintain that police supervision on an increased scale is driving the houses out of existence. In the late days of the last century and the early part of this one, the whorehouse was an accepted, if not openly discussed, institution. It was said that its existence protected decent women. An unmarried man could go to one of these houses and evacuate the sexual energy which was making him uneasy, and at the same time maintain the popular attitudes about the purity and loveliness of a woman. It was a mystery, but then there are many mysterious things in our social thinking. These houses range from palaces filled with gold and velvet to the crummiest cribs where the stench would drive a pig away. Every once in a while, a story would start about how young girls were stolen and enslaved by the controllers of the industry, and perhaps many of the stories were true. But the great majority of whores drifted into their profession through laziness and stupidity. In the houses, they had no responsibility. They were fed and clothed and taken care of until they were too old, and then they were kicked out. This ending was no deterrent. No one who is young is ever going to be old. Now and then a smart girl came into the profession, but she usually moved up to better things. She got a house of her own or worked successfully at blackmail or married a rich man. There was even a special name for the smart ones. They were grandly called courtesans. Mr. Edwards had no trouble either in recruiting or in controlling his girls. If a girl was not properly stupid, he threw her out. He did not want very pretty girls either. Some local young man might fall in love with a pretty whore, and there would be held to pay. When any of his girls became pregnant, they had the choice of leaving or of being aborted so brutally that a fair proportion died. In spite of this, the girls usually chose abortion. It was not always smooth sailing for Mr. Edwards. He did have his problems. At the time of which I am telling you, he had been subjected to a series of misfortunes. A train wreck had killed off two units of four girls each. Another of his units he lost to conversion when a small-town preacher suddenly caught fire and began igniting the townsfolk with his sermons. The swelling congregation had to move out of the church and into the fields. Then, as happened so often, the preacher turned over his whole card and sure fire card. He predicted the date of the end of the world and the whole county moved bleeding in on him. Mr. Edwards went to the town, took the heavy quirt from a suitcase, and whipped the girls unmercifully. Instead of seeing the thing his way, the girls begged for more whipping to wipe out their fancied sins. He gave up in disgust, took their clothes, and went back to Boston. 
The girls achieved a certain prominence when they were, went naked to the camp meeting to confess and testify. That is how Mr. Edwards happened to be interviewing and recruiting numbers of girls instead of picking one up here and there. He had three units to rebuild from the ground. I don't know how Kathy Ames heard about Mr. Edwards. Perhaps a hack driver told her. The, world, the word got around when a girl really wanted to know. Mr. Edwards had not had a good morning when she came into his office. The pain in his stomach he ascribed to a halibut chowder his wife had given him for supper the night before. He had been up all night. The chowder had blown both ways, and he still felt weak and crampy. For this reason, he did not take it in all at once the girl who called herself Catherine Amesbury. She was far too pretty for his business. Her voice was low and throaty. She was slight, almost delicate, and her skin was lovely. In a word, she was not Mr. Edwards' kind of girl at all. If he had not been weak, he would have rejected her instantly. But while he did not look at her very closely during the routine questioning, mostly about relatives who might cause trouble, something in Mr. Edwards' body began to feel her. Mr. Edwards was not a concupiscent man, and besides, he never mixed his professional life with his private pleasures. His reaction startled him. He looked up, puzzled at the girl, and her eyelids dipped sweetly and mysteriously, and there was just a suggestion of a sway on her lightly padded hips. Her little mouth wore a cat smile. Mr. Edwards leaned forward on his desk, breathing heavily. He realized that he wanted this one for his own. I can't understand why a girl like you, he began, and fell right into the oldest conviction in the world, that the girl you are in love with can't possibly be anything but true and honest. My father is dead, Catherine said modestly. Before he died, he had let things go to pieces. We didn't know how he had borrowed money on the farm, and I can't let the bank take it away from my mother. The shock would kill her. Catherine's eyes dimmed with tears. I thought maybe I could make enough to keep up the interest. If ever Mr. Edwards had a chance, it was now. And indeed, a little warning buzz did sound in his brain, but it was not loud enough. About 80% of the girls who came to him needed money to pay off a mortgage, and Mr. Edwards made it an unvarying rule not to believe anything his girls said at any time beyond what they had for breakfast, and they sometimes lied about that. And here he was, a big, fat, grown-up whoremaster, leaning his stomach against his desk while his cheeks darkened with blood and excited chills ran up his legs and thighs. Mr. Edwards heard himself saying, Well now, my dear, let's talk this over. Maybe we can figure some way for you to get the interest money. And this to a girl who had simply asked for a job as a whore. Or had she? Mrs. Edwards was persistently, if not profoundly, religious. She spent a great part of her time with the mechanics of her church, which did not leave her time for either its background or its effects. To her, Mr. Edwards was in the importing business, and even if she had known, which she probably did, what business he was really in, she would not have believed it. And this is another mystery. Her husband had always been to her a coldly thoughtful man who made few and dutiful physical demands on her. If he had never been warm, he had never been cruel either. Her dramas and her emotions had to do with the boys, with the vestry, and with food. She was content with her life and thankful. When her husband's disposition began to disintegrate, causing him to be restless and snappish, to sit staring and then to rush out of the house in a nervous rage, she ascribed at first to his stomach and then to business reverses. When by accident she came upon him in the bathroom, sitting on the toilet and crying softly to himself, she knew he was a sick man. He tried quickly to cover his red, brimming eyes from her scrutiny. When neither herb nor teas nor physics curd him, she was helpless. If in all the years Mr. Edwards had heard about anyone like himself, he would have laughed. For Mr. Edwards, as cold-blooded a whoremaster as ever lived, had fallen hopelessly miserably in love with Catherine Amesbury. He rented a sweet little brick house for her and then gave it to her. He bought her every imaginable luxury, over-decorated the house, and kept it over warm. The carpeting was too deep and the walls were crowded with heavy framed pictures. Mr. Edwards had never experienced such misery. 
As a matter of business, he had learned so much about women that he did not trust one for a second. And since he deeply loved Catherine and love requires trust, he was torn to quivering fragments by his emotion. He had to trust her, and at the same time, he did not trust her. He tried to buy her loyalty with presents and with money. When he was away from her, he tortured himself with the thought of other men slipping into her house. He hated to leave Boston to check up on his units because this would leave Catherine alone. To a certain extent, he began to neglect his business. It was his first experience with this kind of love, and it nearly killed him. One thing Mr. Edwards did not know, and could not know because Catherine would not permit it, was that she was faithful to him in a sense that she did not receive or visit other men. To Catherine, Mr. Edwards was as cold a business proposition as his units were to him, and as he had his techniques, so had she hers. Once she had him, which was very soon, she managed always to seem slightly dissatisfied. She gave him an impression of restlessness, as though she might take flight at any moment. When she knew he was going to visit her, she made it a point to be out and to come in glowing as from some incredible experience. She complained a good deal about the difficulties of avoiding the lecherous looks and touches of men in the street who could not keep away from her. Several times she ran frightened into the house, having barely escaped a man who had followed her. When she would return in the late afternoon and find him waiting for her, she would explain, Why, I was shopping. I have shopping. I have to go shopping, you know. And she made it sound like a lie. In their sexual relations, she convinced him that the result was not quite satisfactory to her, that if he were a better man, he could release a flood of unbelievable reaction in her. Her method was to keep him continually off balance. She saw with satisfaction his nerves begin to go, his hands take to quivering, his loss of weight, and the wild glazed look in his eyes. And when she delicately sensed the near approach of insane, punishing rage, she sat in his lap and soothed him and made him believe for a moment in her innocence. She could convince him. Catherine wanted money, and she set about getting it as quickly and as, and as easily as she could. When she had successfully reduced him to a pulp, and Catherine knew exactly when the time had come, she began to steal from him. She went through his pockets and took any large bills she found. She didn't dare accuse her for fear she would go away. The presents of jewelry he gave her disappeared, and although she said she had lost them and he knew they had been sold, she padded the grocery bills, added to the prices of clothes. He could not bring himself to stop it. She did not sell the house, but she mortgaged it for every penny she could get. One evening, his key did not fit in the lock of the front door. She answered his pounding after a long time. Yes, she had changed the locks because she had lost her key. She was afraid living alone. Anyone could get in. She would get him another key, but she never did. He always had to ring the bell after that, and sometimes it took a long time for her to answer, and at other times his ring was not answered at all. There was no way for him to know whether she was at home or not. Mr. Edwards had her followed, and she did not know how often. Mr. Edwards was essentially a simple man, but even a simple man has complexities which are dark and twisted. Catherine was clever, but even a clever woman misses some of the strange quarters in a man. She made only one bad slip, and she had tried to avoid that one. As was proper, Mr. Edwards had stocked the pretty little nest with champagne. Catherine had from the first refused to touch it. It makes me sick, she explained. I've tried it, and I can't drink it. Nonsense, he said. Just have one glass. It can't hurt you. No, thank you. No, I can't drink it. Mr. Edwards thought of her reluctance as a delicate, a ladylike quality. He had never insisted until one evening when it occurred to him that he knew nothing about her. Wine might loosen her tongue. The more he thought of it, the better the idea seemed to him. It's not friendly of you to not have a glass with me. I tell you, it doesn't agree with me. Nonsense. I tell you, I don't want it. This is silly, he said. Do you want me to be angry with you? No. Then drink a glass. I don't want it. Drink it. He held a glass for her and she retreated from it. 
You don't know. It's not good for me. Drink it. She took the glass and poured it down and stood still, quivering, seeming to listen. The blood flowed to her cheeks. She poured another glass for herself and another. Her eyes became set and cold. Mr. Edwards felt a fear of her. Something was happening to her which neither she nor he could control. I didn't want to do it. Remember that, she said calmly. Maybe you'd better not have any more. She laughed and poured herself another glass. It doesn't matter now, she said. More won't make much difference. It's nice to have a glass or so, he said uneasily. She spoke to him softly. You fat slug, she said. What do you know about me? Do you think I can't read every rotten thought you ever had? Want me to tell you? You wonder where a nice girl like me learned tricks. I'll tell you. I learned them in cribs. You hear? Cribs. I've worked in places you never even heard of. Four years. Sailors brought me little tricks from Port Said. I know every nerve in your lousy body and I can use them. Catherine, he protested. You don't know what you're saying. I could see it. You thought I would talk. Well, I'm talking. She advanced slowly toward him, and Mr. Edwards overcame his impulse to edge away. He was afraid of her, but he sat still. Directly in front of him, she drank the last champagne in her glass, delicately struck the rim on the table, and jammed the ragged edge against his cheek. And then he did run from the house, and he could hear her laughing as he went. Love to a man like Mr. Edwards is a crippling emotion. It ruined his judgment, canceled his knowledge, weakened him. He told himself that she was hysterical and tried to believe it, and it was made easier for him by Catherine. Her outbreak had terrified her, and for a time she made every effort to restore his sweet picture of her. A man so painfully in love is capable of self-torture beyond belief. Mr. Edwards wanted with all his heart to believe in her goodness, but he was forced not to, as much by his own particular devil as by her outbreak. Almost instinctively, he went about learning the truth and at the same time disbelieved it. He knew, for instance, that she would not put her money in a bank. One of his employees, using a complicated set of mirrors, found out the place in the cellar of the little brick house where she did keep it. One day, a clipping came from the agency he employed. It was an old newspaper account of a fire from a small town weekly. Mr. Edwards studied it. His chest and stomach turned to molten metal and a redness glowed in his head behind his eyes. There was real fear mixed up in his love and the precipitate from the mixing of these two is cruelty. He staggered dizzily to his office couch and lay face down, his forehead against the cool black leather. For a time he hung suspended, hardly breathing. Gradually, his brain cleared. His mouth tasted salty, and there was a great ache of anger in his shoulders. But he was calm, and his mind cut its intention through time like the sharp beam of a searchlight through a dark room. He moved slowly, checking his suitcase just as he always did when he started out to inspect his units. Clean shirts and underwear, a nightgown and slippers, and the heavy quirt with the lash curving around the end of the suitcase. He moved heavily up the little garden in front of the brick house and rang the bell. Catherine answered it immediately. She had on her coat and hat. Oh, she said, what a shame. I must go out for a while. Mr. Edwards put his suitcase down. No, he said. She studied him. Something was changed. He lumbered past her and went down into the cellar. Where are you going? Her voice was shrill. He did not reply. In a moment, he came up again, carrying a small oak box. He opened his suitcase and put the box inside. That's mine, she said softly. I know. What are you up to? I thought we'd go for a little trip. Where? I can't go. Little town in Connecticut. I have some business there. You told me once you wanted to work. You're going to work. I, I don't want to now. You can't make me. Why, I'll call the police. He smiled so horribly that she stepped back from him. His temples were thudding with blood. Maybe you'd rather go to your hometown, he said. They had a big fire there several years ago. Do you remember that fire? 
Her eyes probed and searched him, seeking a soft place, but his eyes were flat and hard. What do you want me to do? She asked quietly. Just come for a little trip with me. You said you wanted to work. She could think of only one plan. She must go along with him and wait for a chance. A man couldn't always watch. It would be dangerous to thwart him now. Best go along with it and wait. That always worked. It always had. But his words had given Catherine real fear. In the small town, they got off the train at dusk, walked down its one dark street, and out onto and, and out into the country. Catherine was wary and watchful. She had no access to his plan. In her purse, she had a thin bladed knife. Mr. Edwards thought he knew what he intended to do. He meant to whip her and put her in one of the rooms at the inn, whip her and move her to another town, and so on until she was of no use any more. Then he would throw her out. The local constable would see to it that she did not run away. The knife did not bother him. He knew about that. The first thing he did when they stopped in a private place between a stone wall and a fringe of cedars was to jerk the purse from her hand and throw it over the wall. That took care of the knife. But he didn't know about himself, because in all his life he had never been in love with a woman. He thought he only meant to punish her. After two slashes, the quirt was not enough. He dropped it on the ground and used his fist. His breathing came out in squealing whines. Catherine did her best not to fall into panic. She tried to duck his threshing fist or at least to make them ineffective, but at last fear overcame her and she tried to run. He leaped at her and brought her down, and by then his fists were not enough. His frantic hand found a stone on the ground, and his cold control was burst through with a red, roaring wave. Later, he looked down on her beaten face. He listened for her heartbeat and could hear nothing over the thumping of his own. Two complete and separate thoughts ran in his mind. One said, have to bury her, have to dig a hole and put her in it. And the other cried like a child. I can't stand it. I couldn't bear to touch her. Then the sickness that follows rage overwhelmed him. He ran from the place, leaving a suitcase, leaving the quirt, leaving the oak box of money. He blundered away in the dusk, wondering only where he could hide his sickness for a while. No question was ever asked of him. After a time of sickness to which his wife ministered tenderly, he went back to his business and never again let the insanity of love come near him. A man who can't learn from experience is a fool, he said. Always afterward, he had a kind of fearful respect for himself. He had never known that the impulse, impulse to kill was in him. That he had not killed Catherine was an accident. Every blow had been intended to crush her. She was a long time unconscious and a long time half conscious. She realized her arm was broken and that she must find help if she wanted to live. Wanting to live forced her to drag herself along the dark road looking for help. She turned in at a gate and almost made the steps of the house before she fainted. The roosters were crowing in the chicken house, and a gray rim of dawn lay on the east. Chapter 10 when two men live together, they usually maintain a kind of shabby neatness out of incipient rage at each other. Two men alone are constantly on the verge of fighting, and they know it. Adam Trask had not been home long before the tensions began to build up. The brothers saw too much of each other, and not enough of anyone else. For a few months, they were busy getting Cyrus's money in order and out at interest. They traveled together to Washington to look at the grave, good stone and on top an iron star with a seal and a hole on the top in which to insert the stick for a little flag on decoration day. The brothers stood by the grave a long time, then they went away and they didn't mention Cyrus. If Cyrus had been dishonest, he had done it well. No one asked questions about the money, but the subject was on Charles's mind. Back on the farm, Adam asked, why don't you buy some new clothes? You're a rich man. You act like you're afraid to spend a penny. I am, said Charles. Why? I might have to give it back. Still harping on that? If there was anything wrong, don't you think you'd have heard about it by now? I don't know, said Charles. I'd rather not talk about it. But that night he brought up the subject again. There's one thing bothers me, he began. About the money? Yes, about the money. If you make that much money, there's bound to be a mess. How do you mean? 
Well, papers and account books and bills of sale, notes, figuring. Well, we went through Father's saying and there wasn't none of that. Maybe he burned it up. Maybe he did, said Charles. The brothers lived by a routine established by Charles, and he never varied it. Charles awakened on the stroke of 4.30 as surely as, through the, as surely as though the brass pendulum on the clock had nudged him. He was awake, in fact, a split second before 4.30. His eyes were open and, and had blinked once before the high gong struck. For a moment, he lay still, looking up into the darkness and scratching his stomach. Then he reached to the table beside his bed, and his hand fell exactly on the block of sulfur matching line. Sulfur matches lying there. His fingers pulled the match free and struck it on the side of the block. The sulfur burned its little blue head before the wood caught. Charles lighted the candle beside his bed. He threw back his blanket and got up. He wore long gray underwear that bagged over his knees and hung loose around his ankles. Yawning, he went, he went to the door, opened it, and called, Half past four, Adam. Time to get up. Wake up. Adam's voice was muffled. Don't you ever forget. It's time to get up. Charles slipped his legs into his pants and hunched them over his hips. You don't have to get up, he said. You're a rich man. You can lay in bed all day. So are you, but we still get up before daylight. You don't have to get up, Charles repeated. But if you're going to farm, you'd better farm. Adam said ruefully. So we're going to buy more land so we can do more work. Come off it, said Charles. Go back to bed if you want to. Adam said, I bet you couldn't sleep if you stayed in bed. You know what I bet? I bet you get up because you want to, and then you take credit for it, like taking credit for six fingers. Charles went into the kitchen and lighted the lamp. You can't lay in bed and run a farm, he said and he knocked the ashes through the grate of the stove and tore some paper over the exposed coals and blew until the flame started. Adam was watching him through the door. You wouldn't use a match, he said. Charles turned angrily. You mind your own goddamn business. Stop picking at me. All right, said Adam, I will. And maybe my business isn't here. That's up to you. Anytime you want to get out, you go right ahead. The quarrel was silly, but Adam couldn't stop it. His voice went on without his will in it, making angry and irritating words. You're damn right I'll go when I want, he said. This is my place as much as yours. Then why don't you do some work on it? Oh, Lord, Adam said. What are we fussing about? Let's not fuss. I don't want trouble, said Charles. He scooped lukewarm mush into two bowls and spun them on the table. The brothers sat down. Charles buttered a slice of bread, gouged out a knife full of jam, and spread it over the butter. He dug butter for a second slice and left a slop of jam on the butter roll. God damn it, can't you wipe your knife? Look at that butter! Charles laid his knife and the bread on the table and placed his hands palm down on either side. You better get off the place, he said. Adam got up. I'd rather live in a pigsty, he said, and he walked out of the house. It was eight months before Charles saw him again. Charles came in from work and found Adam slashing water on his hair and face from the kitchen bucket. Hello, said Charles. How are you? Fine, said Adam. Where'd you go? Boston. No place else? No, just looked at the city. The brothers settled back to their old life, but each took precautions against anger. In a way, each protected the other and so saved himself. Charles, always the early riser, got breakfast ready before he awakened Adam, and Adam kept the house clean and started a set of books on the farm. In this guarded way, they lived for two years before their irritation grew beyond control again. On a winter evening, Adam looked up from his account book. It's nice in California, he said. It's nice in the winter, and you can raise anything there. Sure, you can raise it, but when you got it, what are you going to do with it? How about wheat? They raise a lot of wheat in California. The rust will get to it, said Charles. What makes you so sure? Look, Charles, things grow so fast in California, they say you have to plant and step back quick or you'll get knocked down. Charles said, why the hell don't you go there? I'll buy you out any time you say. 
Adam was quiet then, but in the morning, while he combed his hair and peered in the small mirror, he began at it again. They don't have any winter in California, he said. It's just like spring all the time. I like the winter, said Charles. Adam came toward the stove. Don't be cross, he said. Well, stop picking at me. How many eggs? Four, said Adam. Charles placed seven eggs on top of the warming oven and built his fire carefully of small pieces of kindling until it burned fiercely. He put the skillet down next to the flame. His sullen sullenness left him as he fried the bacon. Adam, he said, I don't know whether you notice it, but it seems like every other word you say is California. Do you really want to go? Adam chuckled. That's what I'm trying to figure out, he said. I don't know. It's like getting up in the morning. I don't want to get up, but I don't want to stay in bed either. You sure make a fuss about it, said Charles. Adam went on. Every morning in the army that damned bugle would sound, and I swore to God if I ever got out I would sleep till noon every day. And here I get up a half hour before Reveille. Will you tell me, Charles, what in hell we're working for? You can't lay in bed and run a farm, said Charles. He stirred the hissing bacon around with a fork. Take a look at it, Adam said earnestly. Neither one of us has got a child or a chick, let alone a wife. And the way we're doing it don't look like we ever will. We don't have time to look around for a wife. And, here's, and here we're figuring to add the Clark place to ours if the price is right. What for? It's a di damn fine piece, said Charles. The two of them together would make one of the best farms in this section. Say, you thinking of getting married? No, and that's what I'm talking about. Come a few years and we'll have the finest farm in this section. Two lonely old farts working our tails off. Then one of us will die off and the fine farm will belong to one lonely old fart. And then he'll die off. What the hell are you talking about? Charles demanded. Fellow can't get comfortable. You make me itch. Get it out. What's on your mind? I'm not having any fun, said Adam. Or anyway, I'm not having enough. I'm working too hard for what I'm getting and I don't have to work at all. Well, why don't you quit? Charles shouted at him. Why don't you get the hell out? I don't see any guards holding you. Go down to the South Seas and lay in a hammock if that's what you want. Don't be cross, said Adam quietly. It's like getting up. I don't want to get up and I don't want to stay down. I don't want to stay here and I don't want to go away. You make me itch, said Charles. Think about it, Charles. You like it here? Yes. And you want to live here all your life? Yes. Jesus, I wish I had it that easy. What do you suppose is the matter with me? I think you've got knocker fever. Come into the inn tonight and get it cured up. Maybe that's it, said Adam. But I never took much satisfaction in a whore. It's all the same, Charles said. You shut your eyes and you can't tell the difference. Some of the boys in the regiment used to keep a squaw around. I had one for a while. Charles turned to him with interest. Father would turn in his grave if he knew you was squawing around. How was it? Pretty nice. She'd wash my clothes and mend and do a little cooking. I mean the other. How was that? Good. Yes, good. And kind of sweet. Kind of soft and sweet. Kind of gentle and soft. You're lucky she didn't put a knife in you while you were asleep. She wouldn't. She was sweet. You've got a funny look in your eye. I guess you were kind of gone on that squaw. I guess I was, said Adam. W what happened to her? Smallpox. You didn't get another one? Adam's eyes were pained. We piled them up like they were logs, over 200 arms and legs sticking out, and we piled brush on top and poured coal oil on. I've heard they can't stand smallpox. C it kills them, said Adam. You're burning the bacon. Charles turned quickly back to the stove. It'll just be crisp, he said. I like it crisp. He shoveled the bacon out on a plate and broke the eggs in the hot grease, and they jumped and fluttered their edges to brown lace and made clucking sounds. There was a school teacher, Charles said. Prettiest thing you ever saw. Had little tiny feet, but all her clothes in New York. Yellow hair, and you never saw such little feet. Sing, too, in the choir. Everybody took to going to church. Damn near stampeded getting into church. 
That was quite a while ago. About the time you wrote about thinking of getting married? Charles grinned. I guess so. I guess there wasn't a young buck in the county who didn't get marrying fever. What happened to her? Well, you know how it is. The women get kind of restless with her here. They got together. First thing you knew, they had her out. I heard she wore silk underwear. Too hoity-toity. School board had her out halfway through the term. Feet no longer than that. Showed her ankles, too, like it was an accident. Always showing her ankles. Did you get to know her? Adam asked. No, I only went to church. Couldn't hardly get in. Girl that pretty's got no right in a little town. Just makes people uneasy. Causes trouble. Adam said, Remember that Samuels girl? She was real pretty. What happened to her? Same thing. Just caused trouble. She went away. I heard she's living in Philadelphia. Does dress making. I heard she gets ten dollars for just making one dress. Maybe we ought to go away from here, Adam said. Charles said, Still thinking of California? I guess so. Charles's temper tore in two. I want you out of here, he shouted. I want you to get off the place. I'll buy you or sell you or anything. Get out, you son of a bitch. He stopped. I guess I don't mean that last, but God damn it, you make me nervous. I'll go, said Adam. In three months, Charles got a colored picture postcard of the bay at Rio, and Adam had written on the back with a splattery pen, It's summer here when it's winter there. Why don't you come down? Six months later, there was another card from Buenos Aires. Dear Charles, my God, this is a big city. They speak French and Spanish both. I'm sending you a book. But no book came. Charles looked for it all the following winter and well into the spring. And instead of the book, Adam arrived. He was brown and his clothes had a foreign look. How are you? Charles asked. Fine. Did you get the book? No. I wonder what happened to it. It had pictures. Going to stay? I guess so. I'll tell you about that country. I don't want to hear about it, said Charles. Christ, you're mean, said Adam. I can just see it all over again. You'll stay around a year or so, and then you'll get restless, and you'll make me restless. We'll get mad at each other, and then we'll get polite to each other, and that's worse. Then we'll blow up, and you'll go away again, and then you'll come back, and we'll do it all over again. Adam asked, Don't you want me to stay? Hell yes, said Charles. I miss you when you're not here, but I can see how it's going to be just the same. And it was just that way. For a while, they reviewed old times. For a while, they recounted the times when they were apart. And finally, they relapsed into the long, ugly silences, the hours of speechless work, the guarded courtesy, the flashes of anger. There were no boundaries to time, so that it seemed endless passing. On an evening, Adam said, You know, I'm going to be 37. That's half a life. Here it comes, said Charles, wasting your life. Look, Adam, could we not have a fight this time? How do you mean? Well, if we run true to form, we'll fight for three or four weeks, getting you ready to go away. If you're getting restless, couldn't you just go away and save all the trouble? Adam laughed and the tension went out of the room. I've got a pretty smart brother, he said. Sure, when I get the itch bad enough, I'll go without fighting. Yes, I like that. You're getting rich, aren't you, Charles? I'm doing all right. I wouldn't say rich. You wouldn't say you bought four buildings in the inn in the village. No, I wouldn't say it. But you did. Charles, you've made this about the prettiest farm anywhere about. Why don't we build a new house, bathtub and running water and a water closet? We're not poor people anymore. Why, they say you're nearly the richest man in this section. We don't need a new house, Charles said gruffly. You take your fancy ideas away. It would be nice to go to the toilet without going outside. You take your fancy ideas away. Adam was amused. Maybe I'll build a pretty little house right over by the woodlot. Say, how would that be? Then we wouldn't get on each other's nerves. I don't want it on the place. The place is half mine. I'll buy you out. But I don't have to sell. Charles's eyes blazed. I'll burn your goddamn house down. I believe you would, 
Adam said, suddenly sobered. I believe you really would. What are you looking like that for? Charles said slowly. I've thought about it a lot, and I've wanted for you to bring it up. I guess you aren't ever going to. What do you mean? You remember when you sent me a telegram for a hundred dollars? You bet I do. Saved my life, I guess. Why? You never paid it back. I must have. You didn't. Adam looked down at the old table where Cyrus had sat, knocking on his wooden leg with a stick. And the old oil lamp was hanging over the center of the table, shedding its unstable yellow light from the round Rochester wick. Adam said slowly, I'll pay you in the morning. I gave you plenty of time to offer. Sure you did, Charles. I should have remembered. He paused, considering, and at last he said, You don't know why I needed the money. I never asked, and I never told. Maybe I was ashamed. I was a prisoner, Charles. I broke jail. I escaped. Charles's mouth was open. What are you talking about? I'm going to tell you. I was a tramp, and I got taken up for vagrancy and put on a road gang. Leg irons at night. Got out in six months and picked right up again. That's how they get their roads built. I served three days less than the six months, then, and then I escaped. Got over the Georgia line, robbed a store for clothes, and sent you the telegram. I don't believe you, Charles said. Yes, I do. You don't tell lies. Of course I believe you. Why didn't you tell me? Maybe I was ashamed, but I'm more ashamed that I didn't pay you. Oh, forget it, said Charles. I don't know why I mentioned it. Good God, no. I'll pay you in the morning. I'll be damned, said Charles. My brother, a jailbird. You don't have to look so happy. I don't know why, said Charles, but it makes me kind of proud. My brother, a jailbird. Tell me this, Adam. Why did you wait till just three days before they let you, let you go to make your break? Adam smiled. Two or three reasons, he said. I was afraid if I served out my time, why, they'd pick me up again. And I figured if I waited till the end, they wouldn't expect me to run away. That makes sense, said Charles. But you said there was one more reason. I guess the other was the most important, Adam said. And it's the hardest to explain. I figured I owed the state six months. That was the sentence. I didn't feel right about cheating. I only cheated for three days. Charles exploded with laughter. You're a crazy son of a bitch, she said with affection. But you say you robbed a store. I sent the money back with 10% interest, Adam said. Charles leaned forward. Tell me about the road gang, Adam. Sure I will, Charles. Sure I will. <clears throat> Chapter 11 Charles had more respect for Adam after he knew about the prison. He felt the warmth for his brother you can feel only for one who is not perfect and therefore no, no target for your hatred. Adam took some advantage of it too. He tempted Charles. Did you ever think, Charles, that we've got enough money to do anything we want to do? All right, what do we want? We could go to Europe. We could walk around Paris. What's that? What's what? I thought I heard someone on the stoop. Probably a cat. I guess so. Have to kill off some of them pretty soon. Charles, we could go to Egypt and walk around the Sphinx. We could stay right here and make some good use of our money. And we could get the hell out to work and make some use of the day. Those goddamn cats! Charles jumped to the door and yanked it open and said, Get! Then he was silent, and Adam saw him staring at the steps. He moved beside him. A dirty bundle of rags and mud was trying to worm its way up the steps. One skinny hand clawed slowly at the stairs. The other dragged helplessly. There was a caked face with cracked lips and eyes peering out of swollen blackened lids. The forehead was laid open, oozing blood back into the matted hair. Adam went down the stairs and kneeled beside the figure. Give me a hand, he said. Come on, let's get her in. Here, look out for that arm. It looks broken. She fainted when they carried her in. Put her in my bed, Adam said. Now I think you better go for the doctor. Don't you think we better hitch up and take her in? Move her? No. Are you crazy? Maybe not as crazy as you. Think about it a minute. 
For God's sake, think about what? Two men living alone, and they've got this in their house. Adam was shocked. You don't mean it. I mean it, all right. I think we better take her in. It'll be all over the county in two hours. How do you know what she is? How'd she get here? What happened to her? Adam, you're taking an awful chance. Adam said coldly, If you don't go now, I'll go and leave you here. I think you're making a mistake. I'll go, but I tell you, we'll suffer for it. I'll do the suffering, said Adam. You go. After Charles left, Adam went to the kitchen and poured hot water from the tea kettle into a basin. In his bedroom, he dampened a handkerchief in the water and loosened the cake blood and dirt on the girl's face. She reeled up to consciousness and her blue eyes glinted at him. His mind went back. It was this room, this bed. His stepmother was standing over him with a damp cloth in her hand and he could feel the little running pains as the water cut through. And she had said something over and over. He heard it, but he could not remember what it was. You'll be all right, he said to the girl. We're getting a doctor. He'll be here right off. Her lips moved a little. Don't try to talk, he said. Don't try to say anything. As he worked gently with his cloth, a huge warmth crept over him. You can stay here, he said. You can stay here as long as you want. I'll take care of you. He squeezed out the cloth and sponged her matted hair and lifted it out of the gashes in her scalp. He could hear himself talking as he worked, almost as though he were a stranger listening. There. Does that hurt? The poor eyes. I'll put some brown paper over your eyes. You'll be all right. That's a bad one on your forehead. I'm afraid you'll have a scar there. Could you tell me your name? No, don't try. There's lots of time. There's lots of time. Do you hear that? That's the doctor's rig. Wasn't that quick? He moved to the kitchen door. In here, Doc. She's in here, he called. She was very badly hurt. If there had been x-rays in that time, the doctor might have found more injuries than he did. As it was, he found enough. Her left arm and three ribs were broken and her jaw was cracked. Her skull was cracked too, and the teeth on the left side were missing. Her scalp was ripped and torn and her forehead lay open to the skull. So much the doctor could see and identify. He set her arm, taped her ribs, and sewed up her scalp. With a pipette and an alcohol flame, he bent a glass tube to go through the aperture where a tooth was missing so that she could drink and take liquid food without moving her cracked jaw. He gave her a large shot, shot of morphine, left a bottle of opium pills, washed his hands, and put on his coat. His patient was asleep before he left the room. In the kitchen, he sat down at the table and drank the hot coffee Charles put in front of him. All right, what happened to her? he asked. How do we know? Charles said truesently. We found her on our porch. If you want to see, go look at the marks on the road where she dragged herself. Know who she is? God, no. You go upstairs at the inn. Is she anybody from there? I haven't been there lately. I couldn't recognize her in that condition anyway. The doctor turned his head toward Adam. You ever see her before? Adam shook his head slowly. Charles said harshly, Say, what you mousing around at? I'll tell you, since you're interested. That girl didn't fall under a harrow even if she looks that way. Somebody did that to her. Somebody who didn't like her at all. If you want the truth, somebody tried to kill her. Why don't you ask her? Charles said. She won't be talking for quite a while. Besides, her skull is cracked and God knows what that will do to her. What I'm getting at is, should I bring the sheriff into this? No, Adam spoke so explosively that the two looked at him. Let her alone. Let her rest. Who's going to take care of her? I am, said Adam. Now, you look here, Charles began. Keep out of it. It's my place as much as yours. Do you want me to go? I didn't mean that. Well, I'll go if she has to go. The doctor said, steady down. What makes you so interested? I wouldn't put a hurt dog out. You wouldn't get that mad about it either. Are you holding something back? Did you go out last night? Did you do it? He was here all night, said Charles. He snores like a goddamn train. Adam said, why can't you let her be? Let her get well. The doctor stood up and dusted his hands. Adam, he said, 
Your father was one of my oldest friends. I know you and your family. You aren't stupid. I don't know why you don't recognize ordinary facts, but you don't seem to. Have to talk to you like a baby. That girl was assaulted. I believe whoever did it tried to kill her. If I don't tell the sheriff about it, I'm breaking the law. I admit I break a few, but not that one. Well, tell him, but don't let him bother her until she's better. It's not my habit to let my patients be bothered, the doctor said. You still want to keep her here? Yes. Your funeral. I'll look in tomorrow. She'll sleep. Give her water and warm soup through the tube if she wants it. He stalked out. Charles turned on his brother. Adam, for God's sake, what is this? Let me alone. What's got into you? Let me alone, you hear? Just let me alone. Christ, said Charles and spat on the floor and went restlessly and uneasily to work. Adam was glad he was gone. He moved about the kitchen, washed the breakfast dishes, and swept the floor. When he had put the kitchen to rights, he went in and drew a chair up to the bed. The girl snored thickly through the morphine. The swelling was going down on her face, but the eyes were blackened and swollen. Adam sat very still, looking at her. Her eyes set and splint her her set and splintered arm lay on her stomach, but her right arm lay on top of the coverlet, and fingers curled like a nest. It was a child's hand, almost a baby's hand. Adam touched her wrist with his finger, and her fingers moved a little in reflex. Her wrist was warm. Secretly, then, as though he were afraid he might be caught, he straightened her hand and touched the little cushion pads on the fingertips. Her fingers were pink and soft, but the skin on the back of her hand seemed to have an underbloom like a pearl. Adam chuckled with delight. Her breathing stopped and became electrically alert. Then her throat clicked and the rhythm snoring continued. Gently, he worked her hand and arm under the cover before he tiptoed out of the room. For several days, Kathy lay in a cave of shock and opium. Her skin felt like lead, and she moved very little because of the pain. She was aware of movement around her. Gradually, her head and her eyes cleared. Two young men were with her, one occasionally and the other a great deal. She knew that another man who came in was the doctor, and there was also a tall, lean man who interest her, interested her more than any of the others, and that interest grew out of fear. Perhaps in her drug sleep, she had picked something up and stored it. Very slowly, her mind assembled the last days and rearranged them. She saw the face of Mr. Edwards, saw it, saw it lose its placid self-sufficiency and dissolve into murder. She had never been so afraid before in her life, but she had learned fear now, and her mind sniffed about like a rat looking for an escape. Mr. Edwards knew about the fire. Did anyone else? And how did he know? A blind, nauseating terror rose in her when she thought of that. From things she heard, she learned that the tall man was the sheriff and wanted to question her, and that the young man named Adam was protecting her from the questioning. Maybe the sheriff knew about the fire. Raised voices came her, gave her the cue to her method. The sheriff said, She must have a name. Somebody must know her. How could she answer? Her jaw is broken. Adam's voice. If she's right-handed, she could spell out answers. Look here, Adam, if somebody tried to kill her, I'd better catch him while I can. Just give me a pencil and let me talk to her. Adam said, you heard the doctor say her skull was cracked. How do you know she can remember? Well, you give me paper and pencil and we'll see. I don't want you to bother her. Adam, God damn it! it doesn't matter what you want. I'm telling you I want a paper and pencil. Then the other young man's voice. What's the matter with you? You make it sound like it was you who did it. Give him a pencil. She had her eyes closed when the three men came quietly into her room. She's asleep, Adam whispered. She opened her eyes and looked at them. The tall man came to the side of the bed. I don't want to bother you, miss. I'm the sheriff. I know you can't talk, but will you just write some things on this? She tried to nod and winced with pain. She blinked her eyes rapidly to indicate assent. That's the girl, said the sheriff. You see, she wants to. He put the tablet on the bed beside her and molded her fingers around the pencil. There we are. Now, what is your name? The three men watched her face. Her mouth grew thin and her eyes squinted. 
She closed her eyes and the pencil began to move. I don't know, it scrawled in huge letters. Here now, there's a fresh sheet. What do you remember? All black. Can't think, the pencil wrote before it went over the edge of the tablet. Don't you remember who you are? Where you came from? Think! She seemed to go through a great struggle, then her face gave up and became tragic. No, mixed up. Help me. Poor child, the sheriff said. I thank you for trying anyway. When you get better, we'll try again. Thank you. Now you don't have to write anymore. The pencil wrote, thank you, and fell from her fingers. She had won the sheriff. He ranged himself with Adam. Only Charles was against her. When the brothers were in her room and it took two of them to help her on the bedpan without hurting her, she studied Charles' salt, dark sullenness. He had something in his face that she recognized that made her uneasy. She saw that he touched the scar on his forehead very often, rubbed it, and drew its outline with his fingers. Once he caught her watching, he looked guiltily at his fingers. Charles said brutally, Don't you worry. You're going to have one like it, maybe even a better one. She smiled at him and he looked away. When Adam came in with her warm soup, Charles said, I'm going in town and drink some beer. Adam couldn't remember ever having been so happy. It didn't bother him that he did not know her name. She had said to call her Kathy, and that was enough for him. He cooked for Kathy, going through recipes used by his mother and his stepmother. Kathy's vitality was great. She began to recover very quickly. The swelling went out of her cheeks and the prettiness of convalescence came to her face. In a short time, she could be helped to a sitting position. She opened and closed her mouth very carefully, and she began to eat soft foods that required little chewing. The bandage was still on her forehead, but the rest of her face was little marked, except for the hollow cheek on the side where the teeth were missing. Kathy was in trouble, and her mind ranged for a way out of it. She spoke little, even when it was not so difficult. One afternoon, she heard someone moving around in the kitchen. She called, Adam, is it you? Charles's voice answered, No, it's me. Would you come in here for just a minute, please? He stood in the doorway. His eyes were sullen. You don't come in much, she said. That's right. You don't like me. I guess that's right, too. Will you tell me why? He struggled to find an answer. I don't trust you. Why not? I don't know. And I don't believe you lost your memory. But why should I lie? I don't know. That's why I don't trust you. There's something I almost recognize. You never saw me in your life. Maybe not. But there's something that bothers me that I ought to know. And how do you know I never saw you? She was silent and he moved to leave. Don't go, she said. What do you intend to do? Intend to do? About what? About me. He regarded her with a new interest. You want the truth? Why else would I ask? I don't know, but I'll tell you. I'm going to get you out of here just as soon as I can. My brother's turned fool, but I'll bring him around if I have to lick him. Could you do that? He's a big man. I could do it. She regarded him levelly. Where is Adam? Gone in town to get some more of your goddamn medicine. You're a mean man. You know what I think? I don't think I'm half as mean as you are under that nice skin. I think you're a devil. She laughed softly. That makes two of us, she said. Charles, how long do I have? For what? How long before you put me out? Tell me truly. All right, I will. About a week or ten days, soon as you can get around. Suppose I don't go. He regarded her craftily, almost with pleasure at the thought of combat. All right, I'll tell you. When you had all that dope, you talked a lot, like in your sleep. I don't believe that. He laughed, for he had seen the quick tightening of her mouth. All right, don't. And if you just go about your business as soon as you can, I won't tell. But if you don't... You'll know all right, and so will the sheriff. I don't believe I said anything bad. What could I say? 
I won't argue with you, and I've got work to do. You asked me, and I told you. He went outside. Back of the hen house, he leaned over and laughed and slapped his leg. I thought she was smarter, he said to himself, and he felt more easy than he had for days. Charles had frightened her badly, and if he had recognized her, so had she recognized him. He was the only person she had ever met who played it her way. Kathy followed his thinking, and it did not reassure her. She knew that her tricks would not work with him, and she needed protection and rest. Her money was gone. She had to be sheltered and would have to be for a long time. She was tired and sick, but her mind went skipping among possibilities. Adam came back from town with a bottle of painkiller. He poured a tablespoonful. This will taste horrible, he said. It's good stuff, though. She took it without protest, did not even make much of a face about it. You're good to me, she said. I wonder why. I've brought you trouble. You have not? You've brightened up the whole house. Never complain or anything. Hurt as bad as you are. You're so good. So kind. I want to be. Do you have to go out? Couldn't you stay and talk to me? Sure I could. There's nothing so important to do. Drop a chair, Adam, and sit down. When he was seated, she stretched her hand right toward him, and he took it in both of his. So good and kind, she repeated. Adam, you keep promises, don't you? I try to. What are you thinking about? I'm alone, and I'm afraid, she cried. I'm afraid. Can't I help you? I don't think anyone can help me. Tell me, and let me try. That's the worst part. I can't even tell you. Why not? If it's a secret, I won't tell it. It's not my secret, don't you see? No, I don't. Her fingers gripped his hand tightly. Adam, I didn't ever lose my memory. Then why did you say? That's what I'm trying to tell you. Did you love your father, Adam? I guess I revered him more than loved him. Well, if someone you revered were in trouble, wouldn't you do anything to save him from destruction? Well, sure. I guess I would. Well, that's how it is with me. But how did you get hurt? That's part of it. That's why I can't tell. Was it your father? Oh, no, but it's all tied up together. You mean, if you tell me who hurt you, then your father will be in trouble? She sighed. He would make up the story himself. Adam, will you trust me? Of course. It's an awful thing to ask. No, it isn't, not if you're protecting your father. You understand, it's not my secret. If it were, I'd tell you in a minute. Of course I understand. I'd do the same thing myself. Oh, you understand so much. Tears welled up in her eyes. He leaned down toward her and kissed, and she kissed him on the cheek. Don't you worry, he said. I'll take care of you. She lay back against the pillow. I, I don't think you can. What do you mean? Well, your brother doesn't like me. He wants me to get out of here. Did he tell you that? Oh, no, I can just feel it. He hasn't your understanding. He has a good heart. I know that, but he doesn't have your kindness. And when I have to go, the sheriff is going to begin asking questions and I'll be all alone. He stared into space. My brother can't make you go. I own half of this farm. I have my own money. If he wanted me to go, I would have to. I can't spoil your life. Adam stood up and strode out of the room. He went to the back door and looked out on the afternoon. Far off in the field, his brother was lifting stones from a sled and piling them on the stone wall. Adam looked up at the sky. A blanket of herring clouds was rolling in from the east. He sighed deeply and his breath made a tickling, excited feeling in his chest. His ears seemed suddenly clear so that he heard the chickens cackling and the east wind blowing over the ground. He heard horses' hoofs plodding on the road and far off pounding on wood where a neighbor was shingling a barn. And all these sounds related into a kind of music. His eyes were clear too. Fences and walls and sheds stood staunchly out in the yellow afternoon and they were related too. There was change in everything. 
A flight of sparrows dropped into the dust and scrabbled for bits of food and then flew off like a gray scarf twisting in the light. Adam looked back at his, at his brother. He had lost track of time and he did not know how long he had been standing in the doorway. No time had passed. Charles was still struggling with the same large stone and Adam had not released the full held breath he had taken when time stopped. Suddenly he knew joy and sorrow felt it into one fabric. Courage and fear were one thing too. He found that he had started to hum a droning little tune. He turned, walked through the kitchen, and stood in the doorway looking at Kathy. She smiled weakly at him and he thought, what a child, what a helpless child, and a surge of love filled him. Will you marry me? He asked. Her face tightened and her hand closed convulsively. You don't have to tell me now, he said. I want you to think about it, but if you would marry me, I could protect you. No one could hurt you again. Kathy recovered in an instant. Come here, Adam. There, sit down. Here, give me your hand. That's good. That's right. She raised her hand and put the back of it against her cheek. My dear, she said brokenly. Oh, my dear. Look, Adam, you have trusted me. Now will you promise me something? Will you promise not to tell your brother you have asked me? Asked you to marry me? Why shouldn't I? It's not that. I want this night to think. I want maybe more than this night. Could you let me do that? She raised her hand to her head. You know I'm not sure I can think straight, and I want to. Do you think you might marry me? Please, Adam, let me go alone to think. Please, my dear. He smiled and said nervously, don't make it long. I'm kind of like a cat up a tree so far he can't come down. Just let me think. And Adam, you're a kind man. He went outside and walked toward where his brother was loading stones. When he was gone, Kathy got up from her bed and moved on steadily to the bureau. She leaned forward and looked at her face. The bandage was still on her forehead. She raised the edge of it enough to see the angry red underneath. She had not only made up her mind to marry Adam, but she had so decided before he had asked her. She was afraid. She needed protection and money, and Adam could give her both. And she could control him. She knew that. She did not want to be married, but for the time being it was a refuge. Only one thing bothered her. Adam had a warmth toward her which she did not understand, since she had none toward him, nor had she ever experienced it toward anyone. And Mr. Edwards had really frightened her. That had been the only time in her life she had lost control of a situation. She determined never to let it happen again. She smiled to herself when she thought what Charles would say. She felt a kinship to Charles. She didn't mind his suspicion of her. Charles straightened up when Adam approached. He put his palms against the small of his back and massaged the tired muscles. My God, that is a lot of rocks, he said. Fellow in the army told me there's valleys in California, miles and miles, and you can't find a stone, not even a little one. There'll be something else, said Charles. I don't think there's any farm without something wrong with it. Out in the Middle West, it's locusts, someplace else it's tornadoes. What's a few stones? I guess you're right. I thought I'd give you a hand. That's nice of you. I thought you'd spend the rest of your life holding hands with that and there. How long is she going to stay? Adam was on the point of telling him of his proposal, but the tone of Charles's voice made him change his mind. Say, Charles said, Alex Platt came by a little while ago. You'd never think what happened to him. He's found a fortune. How do you mean? Well, you know that place on his property where that clump of cedar sticks out? You know, right on the county road? I know. What about it? Alex went in between those trees in a stone wall. He was hunting rabbits. He found a suitcase and a man's clothes, all packed nice. Soaked up with rain, though. Looked like it had been there some time. And there was a wooden box with a lock. And when he broke it open, there was near $4,000 in it. And he found a purse, too. There wasn't anything in it. No name or anything? That's the strange part. No name, no name on the clothes, no labels on the suits. It's just like the fellow didn't want to be traced. Is Alex going to keep it? He took it into the sheriff, and the sheriff is going to advertise it. And if nobody answers, Alex can keep it. 
Somebody's sure to claim it. I guess so. I didn't tell Alex that. He's feeling so good about it. That's funny about no labels. Not cut out, just didn't have any. That's a lot of money, Adam said. Somebody's bound to claim it. Alex hung around for a while. You know, his wife goes around a lot. Charles was silent. Adam, he said finally, we got to have a talk. The whole county's doing plenty of talking. What about? What do you mean? God damn it about that girl. Two men can't have a girl living with them. Alex says the women are pretty riled up about it. Adam, we can't have it. We live here. We've got a good name. You want me to throw her out before she's well. I want you to get rid of her. Get her out. I don't like her. You never have. I know it. I don't trust her. There's something. Something. I don't know what it is, but I don't like it. When are you going to get her out? Tell you what, Adam said slowly. Give her one more week and then I'll do something about her. You promise? Sure, I promise. Well, that's something. I'll get the word to Alex's wife. From there on, she'll handle the news. Good Lord, I'll be glad to have the house to ourselves again. I don't suppose her memories come back. No, said Adam. Five days later, when Charles had gone to buy some calf feed, Adam drove the buggy to the kitchen steps. He helped Kathy in, tucked a blanket around her knees, and put another around her shoulders. He drove to the county seat and was married to her by a justice of the peace. Charles was home when they returned. He looked sourly at them when they came into the kitchen. I thought you took her to put her on the train. We got married, Adam said simply. Kathy smiled at Charles. Why? Why did you do it? Why not? Can't a man get married? Kathy went quickly into the bedroom and closed the door. Charles began to rave. She's no damn good, I tell you. She's a whore. Charles! I'll tell you, she's just a two-bit whore. I wouldn't trust her with a bit piece. Why, that bitch, that slut. Charles, stop it. Stop it, I tell you. You keep your filthy mouth shut about my wife. She's no more a wife than an alley cat, Adam said slowly. I think you're jealous, Charles. I think you wanted to marry her. Why, you goddamn fool? Me jealous? I won't live in the same house with her. Adam said evenly. You won't have to. I'm going away. You can buy me out if you want. You can have the farm. You always wanted it. You can stay here and rot. Charles's voice lowered. Won't you get rid of her? Please, Adam, throw her out. She'll tear you to pieces. She'll destroy you, Adam. She'll destroy you. How do you know so much about her? Charles's eyes were bleak. I don't, he said, and his mouth snapped shut. Adam did not even ask Kathy whether she wanted to come out for dinner. He carried two plates into the bedroom and sat beside her. We're going to go away, he said. Let me go away. Please, let me. I don't want to make you hate your brother. I wonder why he hates me. I think he's jealous. Her eyes narrowed. Jealous? That's what it looks like to me. You don't have to worry. We're getting out. We're going to California. She said quietly. I, I don't want to go to California. Nonsense. Why, it's nice there. Sun all the time and beautiful. I don't want to go to California. You are my wife, he said softly. I want you to go with me. She was silent and did not speak of it again. They heard Charles slam out the door and Adam said, that will be good for him. He'll get a little drunk and he'll feel better. Kathy modestly looked at her fingers. Adam, I can't be a wife to you until I'm well. I know, he said. I understand. I'll wait. But I want you to stay with me. I'm afraid of Charles. He hates me so. I'll bring my cot in here. Then you can call me if you're frightened. You can reach out and touch me. You're so good, she said. Could we have some tea? Why, sure, I'd like some myself. He brought the steaming cups in and went back for the sugar bowl. He settled himself in a chair near her bed. It's pretty strong. Is it too strong for you? I like it strong. He finished his cup. Does it taste strange to you? It's got a funny taste. Her hand flew to her mouth. 
Oh, let me taste it. She sipped the drugs. Adam, she cried, you got the wrong cup. That was mine. It had my medicine in it. He licked his lips. Well, I guess it can't hurt me. No, it can't, she laughed softly. I hope I don't need to call you in the night. What do you mean? Well, you drink my sleeping medicine. Maybe you wouldn't wake up easily. Adam went down into a heavy opium sleep, though he fought to stay awake. Did the doctor tell you to take this much? He asked thickly. You're just not used to it, she said. Charles came back at 11 o'clock. Kathy heard his tipsy footsteps. He went into his room, flung off his clothes, and got into bed. He grunted in turn, trying to get comfortable, and then he opened his eyes. Kathy was standing by his bed. What do you want? What do you think? Move over a little. Where's Adam? He drank my sleeping medicine by mistake. Move over a little. He breathed harshly. I already been with a whore. You're a pretty strong boy. Move over a little. How about your broken arm? I'll take care of that. It's not your worry. Suddenly Charles laughed. <laughs> the poor bastard, he said, and he threw back the blanket to receive her. Thanks for joining me for tonight's edition of Booked for the Night. I'll be back tomorrow night with more of East of Eden by John Steinbeck. Until then, thanks for listening and good night.